morning, everybody. Good to be in worship with you here today. Seems like I've spent a lot of time between these four walls in the last week, but it's wonderful to see you here the Sunday after Easter. I want to extend a word of greeting to our KXRA and to thank those who have sponsored that ministry in these past years. We're glad you're listening. We're thankful that you're tuned in to the service here at First Congregational United Church of Christ. And uh, we hope that you'll come visit us sometime. We're right across from the new um, sheriff's office, right across the street from Calvary Lutheran, and there we are, the church with a big heart for people in need. I want to um, remind you that today we have a Bible study. The Bible study itself has uh, been on hiatus during the Advent season or the uh, Lenten season, but it's after Easter now, and we've got a little extra time. Today we're going to look at the theme of resurrection and what that means for us. What does the resurrection new life mean for our lives? And you can come and you can just sit and listen in if you like. You don't have to get all involved. We, we want you in whatever capacity you come. You don't even need to bring your Bible because all of the scriptures we're looking at are printed out on a sheet. And for that reason, um, hopefully there'll be no obstacles to you joining us today. Um, grab a cup of coffee and about 11.15 we'll meet in the Cambridge room and we should be done by about 12.15. Give me plenty of time to rejuvenate and get ready for the Bethany service at 2. We have a women's fellowship meeting coming up and it's a brown bag lunch. So bring your own vittles from home. Our hostess chairs this month are Julie Jelm and Kay Sukovic who just returned today. Are we ever glad to see you, Kay? Welcome back. And finally, a word to our angels. Thank you for the ministry that you conduct in our name. As you bring uh, your care blankets and food to the visits to those who have been hospitalized or have recently experienced a loss, it's a wonderful way to express the care and love of this church and the love of Jesus Christ. So we're thankful to all of the angels who are engaged in that ministry. I'd like to invite all who are able to please rise and to greet those around them, let them all know how good it is to be here at First Congregational United Church of Christ, where we believe, belong, and are becoming. Good morning, Margaret. Hi, Kirk. Thank you for coming today. Good morning, Jane. Hey, Stuart. Please remain standing as we continue in worship. I'll share a brief prayer of invocation, and then Kirk Anderson, our lay liturgist today, will lead us in our responsive call to worship. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? We come to you this day, O oh God, with hearts joyful. It's been a long and trying week. We've worked hard. We've played hard. We spent time with family and friends. We have spent time in prayer with you. And now we are here to worship you, to give you thanks for the blessings of this week, for the gifts that you have showered into our lives and the lives of our loved ones, and to praise your name and to seek your guidance, to seek direction. What will the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, mean for us as your people, for this church and our community and our world? We ask, O oh God, that you'll inspire us by your presence through your Holy Spirit, that you'll infuse us with a sense of hope and purpose, and that through your Spirit you carry us into a future of your own creation. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Sir? Please.
Please join me in our responsive call to worship. God is our strength and our salvation. We will not fear. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God for mighty deeds and extravagant love. Praise God for loving care and answered prayer. We'll give thanks this day, for God is good. The steadfast love of God endures forever. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come. We are witnesses to the God who acts. We are here to offer our worship and to sing to God our praise. Come, you faithful, raise the strain of triumphant gladness. God has brought all his strength into the joy from sadness. His strong arrows did to go, Jacob's sons and daughters, let them live the price and foot. Through the Red Sea waters, 
join us in the responsive Psalter reading on, if you look at the back on page 700, it's Psalm 118, 14 through 29. And you'll notice the R will be for the response. And to start with, the Margaret will play it through once, the choir will play it through, and then we'll all do it. And then ongoing, everyone will do it on the R for response. is my strength and my might. He has come, become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The righteous shall enter the gate of
Please be seated. I mentioned in passing that I've spent a lot of time this week between these four walls. That's not altogether a bad thing. In this holy and sacred place, we have remembered God's love for us and for God's love servants, Helen Williams and Merle Higley. Two services were conducted this week, and I'm happy to report that the sanctuary was nearly full for each of those services. A wonderful testimony to the legacy of love that our church members have left and to your faithful support of them. Helen Williams was one of a kind, a sweet little old lady, and I don't use that term um, pejoratively. She was just the sweetest, kindest little gal that you'd ever want to meet. Involved in friendly service, involved in many ways giving back to the community, a staunch supporter of the church, and one who we will surely miss. The night before she died, I was at her home in her bedroom, and family surrounded us. And as I always do, I, I made a point of, of asking the question, you know how much you're loved by God, don't you, Helen? And she looked at me and she nodded, yes, I do. <laughs> and then she beckoned for me to come a little closer, and she said, I like your Easter haircut. <laughs> <laughs> How was Helen Williams, in a nutshell? We're talking about the things of eternity, and yet, in juxtaposition, there was the pastor's haircut. God is with us in the little and the big moments of our lives, and that is the truth that will set us free. It was much the same for Merle Higley. I learned so much about Merle preparing for his service, but I didn't know that he also sang in a men's cantata group. I knew that he really enjoyed the Ole and Lena um, play that we put on, but I didn't know that he was a thespian. He raised iridescent blue peacocks and pigeons, and he grew flowers of every make and variety. One of his um, nieces said that one Easter... He captured a bunch of the white pigeons that would fly around his farm, and he had five vats of dye, colored dye, and he dipped their wings into the dye. And then when they dried, he let them loose. And she said it was like a rainbow flying above the farm. (laughs) She said that made that Easter so special. Merle also was a painter, And you knew this because we had most of his work displayed in a gallery downstairs. A lot of that was procured by his family and friends at the service yesterday with permission from the family. They wanted a bit of Merle, a bit of his legacy to take with them. But he used to go up and down the halls at uh, Knute Nelson on his walker, and he'd have five or six paintings propped there at the top of the walker, and if he happened upon someone who looked like they were having a down day, he'd say, here, have one of my paintings. (laughs) And he brought light and creativity and love into the hearts and lives of so many people. We're going to miss Helen, and we're going to miss Merle. They were um, two of a kind, very special individuals, and I think we honored and celebrated their lives to the max. As we enter this time of prayer, I'd like to invite you to call into your hearts and minds the images of loved ones near and dear who have made an impact in your life, who have brought a bright rainbow of love into your, your, uh, your, your heavenly skies, who have brought a, a bit of light in the depth of your heart through words they have spoken or poems they have written, or perhaps pictures they have created, or paintings they have made, and to give God thanks for those people, for they are true treasures to us, and they will be missed. And while they live, we must thank God and value them. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. I talked to John this week, and um, John Gooderman, who was one of our presenters during the midweek service, um, after his presentation, was diagnosed with uh, terminal brain cancer. And um, I talked to him, and he assured me that uh, the doctors um, said that he was in good hands, that they would be able to manage the, the pain that would come with this, but they have given him 14 months to live. At, at the most. And he said, as much as anything, I need for you to pray for Dawn, my wife, because she's the one carrying the bigger burden right now. So yeah, thank you for reminding me about John. Let's enter this time of prayer now as, um, as we prepare to pray. I would invite you to hear Margaret Kalina's beautiful music and to know God is with, with us in this moment. Holy God, we ask that you be with us as you always promised to be, and that we remember that we are never alone on this life journey. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. Your rod and thy staff, they comfort us. In the darkest times of our lives, at those times when we experience loss or death, you are with us then touching us, bearing witness to your love for us, promising us new life through word and in the actuality of eternal life. We thank you for the gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus, your loved Son who gave his life that we might all live. For this gift, O oh God, we are truly grateful and thankful that you did not leave us to our own resources, limited as they are, but lifted us up as if on angels' wings into the light and the heavenly truth of your kingdom divine. Walk with those, O oh God, who grieve the loss of Merle and Helen, Strengthen them in that peace and comfort that pass all human understanding. That peace is our hope as well, O oh God. It reminds us not only that we are not alone, but that that peace endures from this moment to the time in which we are finally embraced in your loving arms in your heavenly kingdom, world without end. For those we have prayed for silently this day, prayers for healing and rest and peace and comfort and life, we ask, O oh God, that you hear our prayers and respond as you always do in love. And now we gather all of our prayers together into that one great prayer, which Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught us, praying together with one voice, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading on which the homily today is based comes to us from the lectionary text, which is John 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I now send you. And with that, he breathed on them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they will not be forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve disciples, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Didymus said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, a week later, his disciples were still in the house, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have still believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you may have life in his name. It's going to be a challenge today, isn't it? May God add a blessing to the hearing, understanding, and living of the word. An old preacher was dying, and he knew it. He sent a messenger for the IRS agent and his lawyer, both who happened to be church members, to come to his house. When they arrived, they were ushered up into his bedroom. As they entered his room, the preacher was there in bed with the blankets pulled right up to his chin. He held out his hands and he motioned for the two of them to sit in chairs, The preacher grasped their hands and sighed contentedly, smiled, lay back, and just stared at the ceiling. For a long time, no one said anything until finally the lawyer got up courage to ask, Pastor, I'm curious, why did you ask for the two of us to come? The old preacher mustered up some strength and he said weakly, the good book says that Jesus died between two thieves, and that's how I want to go too. (laughs) There are times in all of our lives, just like that old preacher, where all we can do is hunker down, lay in bed, pull the blankets right up to our chin, and stare at the ceiling. For all practical purposes, that's pretty much the description of the disciples that we get today 
in the Gospel of John. Check this out. Notice that John begins by saying, quote, it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, end of quote. Which, when you think about it, makes pretty good sense. After all they'd been through, seeing Jesus snatched by the Roman authorities, watching as he was whipped to within an inch of his life, observing, albeit at a distance, as Jesus was nailed to the cross and left to die, who could blame those disciples for hiding out, hunkering down, playing it safe, protecting their own hides? But did you catch this? In verse 26 it says, quote, A week later his disciples were again in the house. Only then Thomas was with them. It's like John is telling us that maybe... They snuck out for some food or a breath of fresh air in the dead of night when nobody would catch them, nobody was looking, but for all practical purposes, those disciples were secretly hiding out in that upper room for more than a week, a week after Easter. In spite of the good news, in spite of Jesus breathing his Holy Spirit of new life upon them, in spite of Thomas's physical proof of Jesus' resurrection, these guys were spending their time locked up away in that upper room in the safety and security of that sacred place. Which says to me that it's one thing to know about the resurrection in your head and quite another to believe it in the heart of your being. No one... Now, so one of us questions. So one of the questions that I think the scripture asks us to get, grapple with is this: How do we move forward from that place of head knowledge about the resurrection to a place of heart knowledge, where the resurrection can do us good? Why is this such an important question? Why take time this morning to process what the resurrection means for us? Because it literally means life and death. Every time we choose to shut the doors of our life, every time we close our minds and our hearts, we imprison ourselves. For every person, event, or new idea, we lock out regardless of ourselves in a place of darkness and fear. And that is not the place God chooses to leave us. That's what happened to the disciples in today's gospel lesson. It's Easter evening, the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection, the day they saw the empty tomb with their own eyes, the day Mary Magdalene announces, I've seen the Lord. But the disciples are gathered fearfully behind locked doors. Do you see the irony of this image that John paints for us? Jesus' tomb is open and empty, but the disciples' house is closed and the doors are locked tight. The house had become their tomb. Jesus is on the loose. He's free from death, but his disciples are bound up in fear. The disciples have separated themselves and their lives from the reality of Christ's resurrection, and as a result, the doors of faith have been closed up tight. They have shut their eyes to the reality of new life, the new life that has been offered them. They have locked out Mary Magdalene's words of faith and hope and love. They left the empty tomb of Jesus and they entered the tombs of their fear and doubt and their blindness. And those doors locked from the inside have become the great stone that sealed their tomb. For the gospel to touch our lives and to move us emotionally and intellectually and spiritually, we, we need to make it personal. So as your pastor, I'm, I'm going to ask a personal question today. It's been one... Is your life different this year? Where are you living now? Is it in the freedom and joy of the resurrection? Or behind locked doors? How is our life any different after Easter? And if it isn't any different, what are the locked doors of our lives, our, our hearts and our minds that are holding us back? 
I knew a woman whose life was drawing to a close. Her decades of smoking had finally caught up with her, and she was near death from the complications of COPD. She would have benefited greatly by the daily compassionate visits of a hospice care nurse or a hospice chaplain, but every time I raised it with her, she would say, I'm not Weeks went by, and I finally asked her, why not have a hospice care person come in? It's free, and you would benefit so much from the visits. She thought about it for a minute, and she said, I couldn't bear to have somebody see my messy house. I get that. But do you see how the shame of a messy house had locked this poor woman into a tomb of her own making, effectively cutting her off from the compassionate care and healing and life-sustaining presence offered her? So again, I ask you today, what are the locked or closed places of your life? What keeps you locked in your tomb? What keeps me locked in mine? Maybe like that woman, it's shame. Maybe like the disciples, it's fear. Maybe it's questions or disbelief or some conditions we've placed on our faith. Perhaps it's unresolved sorrow or loss. Maybe wounds that are so deep that it doesn't seem like it's worth the risk to step outside. For others, it might be anger or resentment or misunderstanding. I'm certain that you caught the good news of the gospel today. The good news is that story of the disciples does not end in the tomb of that upper room. John wants us to see that where Christ is present, new life is always possible. Yeah, those disciples were locked up tight for sure for fear of what the Roman and Jewish authorities would do to them if they found out where they were. And that's where they probably would have stayed if not for Jesus. John says in verse 19, quote, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. John is telling us in today's gospel lesson that Jesus is always entering the locked places of our lives, just like with those disciples. He often comes unexpectedly, uninvited, and sometimes even unwanted. Jesus steps into our closed lives, our closed hearts, and our closed minds, and he stands among us, and he offers us peace, and he breathes new life into us. I think it's significant that the Bible does not say that Jesus opened the door for his loved disciples. Rather, it says that he came and stood among them, almost like he materializes out of thin air. He appears to them, which is to say that Jesus' perceived presence gave them all that they needed to move out of that place of darkness and fear. And what was the thing that Jesus gave them? It was peace. And with the peace of Christ's presence, the peace and comfort that passes all human understanding, they had everything they needed to move forward in their lives. Regardless of our life circumstances, Jesus shows up surprisingly, amazingly, and he brings us peace. He offers peace. His presence embodies peace. Regardless of our life circumstances, Jesus shows up and he brings life. He offers life. He embodies life. New life and peace are resurrection realities. They are gifts to us. They do not necessarily change the circumstances of our life and world. If you had terminal cancer before, Jesus showed up, you will have it after. The storms will still form. The hungry will still need to be fed. Loved ones will still die. But the life and the peace of Jesus enable us to meet and to live through those circumstances. Jesus gives us his peace his breath, his new life, and then 
he sends us out. We are then free to unlock the doors of our lives from the inside, to step outside into our new lives, marked by love and service in his name. Amen. As the apostles filled Jerusalem with their teaching about Jesus, we are called to bring good news to the world. <clears throat> Our witness is in the world and deed, in time and in treasure. Give thanks to all things, for God is good. With our gifts, we express thanks for God's steadfast love, which endures forever. Would the ushers please come forward? For the breath of life, for eyes to see, for insight to believe, for courage to witness, we give thanks, gracious God. The signs of your presence are everywhere. Your glory and dominion are forever and ever. May this offering witness to your grace and peace. Grant your spirit as a transforming power among us that inspires and embraces our service. Amen. Amen. Joyce the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore.
Thank you all for coming to worship today, this first Sunday after Easter. I hope that um, as you go out into the world today, you feel God's blessing and the joy and the meaning of God's love in our lives. And the peace of God be with you. I invite you all to our time of fellowship following the service today. And once you've grabbed that cup of coffee, please do join us for our Bible study in the Cambridge Room from 11.15 until 12.15. If you're a first-time visitor with us today, we're especially pleased that you came, and we ask that you help yourself to one of the Congregational Church Cups here. In it, you'll find, about, find out about our mission and our love to serve God in this community and in our world. And you may even see some opportunities to be the ministries that we're engaged in in this community. Certainly the transportation care team and the angel care team and the work that we do with the food shelf and the work that we continually are engaged in uh, to feed people and, and uh, even through our, our special meals that we conduct through the year. At this time, I would invite you to join me in our responsive benediction, and I will begin. Go out fearless in the strength that God provides. Praise God's mighty deeds by the way you live. In loving obedience, we will witness to our faith. We'll give thanks each day for God's goodness. Grace to you and peace from the one who was and is and who is to come. This day is a precious gift from God. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.